Welcome. Our webinar today is thinking about consciousness and your imagination, or let's say image a nation. Um, our guest speaker is Tommy Nielsen, from the, uh, who's a professor emeritus from the University of Prince Edward Island. I've known Tom for many, many years. In fact, he was best man at my, uh, my wedding. So nice to have you join us, Tommy. Nice uh, to be you here. Know, been, you know, I've been busy during the week, uh, uh, essentially assembling what some of you may recognize as more of a lecture than a, a discussion. We, we will have a discussion uh, as we get finished, but Tommy's been kind enough to put together a, a, a series of insights um, about consciousness and, and particularly about image form formation by the brain uh, through the visual system. So with that as a background, I'm going to say welcome, Tommy. That's our introduction. And I'll, I'll ask uh, the, the viewers to use your chat function to pose questions. Uh, we'll probably reserve them until we're finished with the presentation. But if something really sexy and exciting comes up, uh, uh, I'll be interrupted by Claire and we'll we'll throw the question out here and there. So other than that, I'll leave it to you, Tom. And uh, there's your introduction on the front page. OK, well, uh, what I'm working on is revising a book that's called A Glance at the Dance of Photons. Uh, and it has been published on the Internet. It's a free textbook by uh, this consortium for free textbooks called Pressbook. Uh, the book explains consciousness as a physical entity using pictures and some less technical terms so that I can reach some non-specialist readers. And uh, our uh, consciousness uh, to uh, help them uh, help people appreciate that our consciousness is the basis of everything we do and plan to do. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that consciousness is not merely some hallucination. Uh, it's not some sort of a ghost in the machine of our body or a uh, part of some universal spirit over which we have little or no control. I'm focusing on vision in the book because that's what I know. So um, before we get into yeah. how, the brain, how the brain and I work together to create an image, let's explore some of what we know about consciousness itself. It's become a topic of some popularity as people are asking if a computer with all the knowledge in the world can become conscious. But let's start out first with what it is to be conscious, Tom. Okay, so there are uh, sort of three textbook definitions of consciousness. One, that it's some sort of a global or universal force that's everywhere in the universe. And uh, that's, in a sense, uh, doesn't really tell you very much because if it's a global and everywhere, then you don't have to explain it, right? Uh, it's sort of like mathematics. Uh, Richard Feynman is quoted as saying, the beauty of mathematics is you don't have to explain anything. And Unfortunately, uh, I didn't find that helped me very much when I was studying advanced math. The other second part thing is to consider uh, consciousness as it pertains to the mind as being different from the body. And this is where we get the famous Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And uh, Descartes sort of puts mind as being somewhat similar to the soul, whatever that is. And uh, another question that comes up is, uh, uh, does consciousness really influence our thoughts and behaviors? Uh, or is it merely some sort of a subjective side effect to what's going on in the brain? I think that to uh, really understand consciousness, we have to realize that our view of the world, uh, as well as our, our internal body, it, it's not magic. Uh, it's We're aware of it only because uh, of the connections we have with the world is simply by, you know, one millisecond pulses. There are one 40 milli, 40 milli volts, uh disruptions in the resting state of a neuron that otherwise sits at minus 65 millivolts. That amounts to a change in the ionic composition of a neuron of something like less than 5%. And you think of everything that happens, everything you know, everything you can do, a slight 5% variation in some uh, ions in, in, in your neurons. Uh, the nerve impulse are initiated by millions of nerve cells and what triggers them is that they're irritable. Uh, some outside first force happens and it essentially causes them to temporarily sort of shut down. And in shutting down that disruption, then uh, disrupts a nerve cell connected to it, and uh, we start getting these impulses. 
the only information that we get uh, from all these nerves, whether they come from the eyes or the ears or the stomach, uh, it's all the same, all 40 millivolt pulses. Uh, and uh, the only other information that's there is the particular uh, nerve that's carrying those impulses. Uh, and uh, even then, uh, what determines the effects of those nerve impulses is exactly where they end up in the brain uh, and the fact that they're given some attention, which I think we'll get to a bit later. Well, it, that's an excellent uh, introduction, although it almost looks like we're just defining a reflex. Is a reflex a sign of being conscious? Like when you touch my knee or the doctor touches my knee and bounces up, and, is that a reaction evidence of consciousness? Uh, well, I wouldn't think so. Uh, uh, yet people who consider that consciousness is sort of a property of all living matter might think that that was proof of consciousness. But then again, you know, plants have uh, numerous reflexes. They're often slow, but some are fast enough to catch insects. Okay, so let's take something really complex. Is free will necessary for consciousness to exist? That is, that somehow or another, I am influencing my behavior, and I have free will to do anything I wish on the basis of whatever experience I've had, of course. Uh, I try to avoid this question, Perry, uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, I, as far as I think of what free will means, it means that individuals, as an individual, you're free. Uh, but you could also ask the question, is consciousness necessary for there to be free will? In other words, if you're not conscious, can you have a free will? So the question can go in both ways. Yeah, now, it, so, it, really, it really is an interesting question because... I, I know one can say consciousness is simply observing our behavior, that our behavior is almost automatic and all we are is with our consciousness is observing the behavior that we're engaged in, we're, we're not influencing. And I, I don't know whether anybody has been able to disprove that. Okay, uh, are we conscious when we dream? Uh, it's certainly the case when you record from the brain that what happens during the dreams is very similar to uh, when we're awake and behaving, they even managed a recent paper I saw, saw that they were able to get enough idea of the conscious of what a person was dreaming about and to be able to compare it when they were doing those same activities. And they found that the uh, cortical activity was very similar between the two, high correlation, at least in some parts of the brain. What about a fetus? Does a fetus have consciousness? Uh, well, they're finding some patterns of activity brain activity uh, that seem indicative of when a person is conscious. Uh, uh, Paul McGaffrey sent me a remarkable paper about a change in cortical activity just before a person dies. Uh, and so uh, uh, I would think that one would might be able to, unless you want to posit that all living material has conscious, all living things have consciousness, uh, I think it's, it's certain likely that one can find, but I don't know for sure uh, out of my area whether particular criteria are used uh, in recording from fetal brain activity to determine uh, just what state they're at and uh, what but, whether they might be conscious or not. I mean, I, I'm sure it, it, it's been thought through carefully as when in the course of the emergence of the fetus from the cell, does that brain activity begin to become sustained? And does that necessarily mean that that individual is yet conscious, e even after birth? I mean, at some point, it's not behaving on reflexes anymore. It seems to be able to determine and take action based on what's happening in its environment. So, but there's kicking going on before the baby is born. And some say there's even response to music. So there's yeah. some indicating awareness. Mm -hmm. In any case, uh, is the so-called consciousness, the evidence that we have of it pre present only in organisms. That is, it is it a bi biochemical manifestation that would be present only in living organisms? Well, it's hard, difficult to picture how such complicated things uh, uh, could be generated by just a sort of uh, logic uh, of uh, that digital computers have. Uh, if we want to go to something and do complicated things that is not an organism, uh, 
uh, in principle, though, any computer uh, could be replicated by a bunch of mechanical relays and carry out whatever complication that uh, uh, we generally think of computers being able to do. And, and yet, uh, I'd find it very difficult to think that if you had a warehouse full of uh, relays, that somehow that warehouse would become uh, conscious. Uh, so uh, there are some developments coming in non-digital optical computers. Uh, they can use uh, optical fields uh, to simulate uh, electromagnetic fields, but of course they are electromagnetic, uh, really an easy way to do it. Uh, and they can perform analog processing uh, and that's not confined to numerical calculation. So uh, the uh, certainly complexity is there uh, um, uh, it need not necessarily be mathematical. So uh, the hard problem uh, arises, of course, of how uh, neural activity can result in any kind of uh, subjective effect, such as pictures or feelings. Uh, and uh, yet people that have addressed the hard problem also don't seem to have uh, paid much attention to what's necessary to uh, uh, for this consciousness where where it's it's located it's got to exist somewhere uh, and uh, un unless uh, uh, also if if uh, unless you want to believe this consciousness is something universal uh, and uh, it's only in uh, animals that have it or an uh, have it uh, then you also got to explain, well, how did it evolve? That takes you into what about its physical source in animals? I mean, our evolution, to the extent that we believe that evolution is is an actual ex explained, uh, we should be able to see consciousness in animals as well. They're biochemical organisms. True. Uh, and, well, certainly whatever it is in animals or us that produces consciousness, uh, it would seem it has to be bio biochemical of some nature. Uh, it would seem it have to involve magnetic fields because it couldn't be molecules themselves uh, moving around. That they they'd, they'd be too slow. Uh, and it seems only electromagnetic fields can handle the sort of rap rapid changes and so forth uh, that our uh, consciousness would indicate uh, must uh, take place. So, Tommy, I'm going to distract. I'm going to, I'm going to deviate a little bit here. If we, in, in simplest terms, consider consciousness simply a level of awareness, uh, it would seem that animals are and have awareness. I, I mean, observing the behavior of animals, it would seem that if awareness is the definition of consciousness, we're going to see a lot of animals that are demonstrating uh, a level of awareness of the environment around them behaving appropriately that, that doesn't appear to be reflexive. So it wouldn't be surprising that in the history of organisms, whether it is at the amoeba level, I'm not sure where it begins, but brains do begin to appear fairly complex neural networks as we move through the, uh, uh, the animal kingdom. Um, and those that want to protect animal rights might say, look, you shouldn't be killing cows. They're conscious of what you're doing and they're going to feel emotion and feel pain and blah, blah. And on we go to a a whole new world we live in as we come to understand the relevance of consciousness and, and behavior. So let, let's take us, what is the evolutionary or, origin of consciousness? Do, do you have any views there? Well, uh, the theory that I found most interesting uh, is one that's uh, been presented by uh, uh, Harry Jarrison uh, a number of years ago, before consciousness really uh, was uh, much in the, on the science and science ball field. He's a paleontologist, and he's studied the sizes and shapes of brains through uh, evolutionary uh, periods. Now, one of the things that, that points out about how brains evolve is that when you have the, a very simple animal, like some of the first uh, animals that actually had uh, uh, spinal cords and brains, uh, vertebrates then, uh, this was their brain, uh, essentially a spinal cord with some neural tissue at the front end to sort of coordinate movements uh, uh, to move and uh, to eat or not eat. 
and maybe enough else is just to, some internal functions to keep them alive. Uh, to develop more levels of complexity, your free swimming uh, and so forth, additional brain material had to be added. And the only way you can add more brain material to do more is to put it at the front of this uh, range of uh, neurons, neural, neural fibers here. You can't put it in the middle because that would sort of disrupt stuff. So more and more and more uh, neural tissue was added in order to enable more and more complex functions. When you get to about this level here, uh, you have pretty much what is uh, the brain of, uh, of a reptile. Uh, they have a fairly uh, good uh, region in here that controls movement and with reptiles you find this area enlarged and enlarged. Uh, the, out, the descendants of reptiles, birds, they're, much of their brain is really this region in here uh, rather than the sort of a cortex that uh, neocortex that mammals have. Mammals sort of developed about the same time uh, as uh, evolved from reptiles as dinosaurs did. Um, that, uh, mammals evolved during a period when the earth began to cool. And uh, this presented a problem for uh, dinosaurs uh, because being cold-blooded, when it got cooler, they just simply slowed down. Nerve conduction goes slower and slower to lower the body temperature and their movements became slower. Suddenly, the mammals, being warm-blooded, had a real advantage. They could be active, and they could run around, they could gobble up the drowsy dinosaurs, and they became rules of the earth for a short time. Then the earth started to get warm again. Suddenly, there were problems. Uh, for one thing, uh, the mammals no longer had an advantage being warm-blooded. In fact, it was a disadvantage. They were much more complicated. They were, in order to adapt to new environments and so forth, they had to change a much more extensive changes in their body than the simpler built uh, dinosaurs. The dinosaurs gradually adapted rapidly, took over more and more of the niches on the Earth's surface, even the air. And there was one place where the dinosaurs weren't interested in going. And that was in burrows under the ground. And that was the only place that was left where mammals were able to survive as rodent-like creatures in their burrows. And uh, Jarrison finds evidence of this in his uh, endocraniology of uh, skulls and so forth during over this period. Now, the mammals had a problem when they retreated on the ground. First of all, being uh, how can they find their way? Uh, you can't see where you are anymore. And apparently one of the early things that they did, first signs of some development changes in the brain was in the olfactory brain. Because in tunnels under the ground, they could sniff out roots. They could sniff where mates might be and thus find that. A, uh, another problem underground is that to find their way, they could listen. They could listen to hear if their dinosaurs thumping above the head, they better dig down deeper. Uh, they could listen through the soil to hear if there was someone scratching and scratching in a tunnel uh, not far away. And now the problem is that when you want to develop the sense of smell or hearing, the smell receptors, the, hear the hearing receptors that reptiles and and uh, dinosaurs had uh, were honed to as being as sensitive as was possible or even logical to make. Your sense of hearing is so sensitive that if you go in a completely quiet room, after a while, you'll begin to hear this little sound. Boom, 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 boom. That's the sound of red blood corpuscles bouncing against one another in the capillaries of your ear. There's no point trying to make a more sensitive receptor for hearing and sound than that. So how could they improve to hear better? 
Well, there's another alternative, and that is information processing. And to do more information processing, and with respect to, first of all, the sense of smell, uh, the mammals started growing more brain material out here in the olfactory cortex. And then to improve the sense of hearing, they had to add more uh, brain material again to do more information processing and so forth. Now, one other problem that they faced, of course, being underground is by keeping track of where they are, was using the sense of touch. And in a sense, you could feel what the soil was like, wet, crumbly, so forth. Uh, you could also, from your sense of touch and, and control your limbs, remember how far did I crawl in this direction? And then your vestibular senses tell you, I turned about so many degrees and then I crawled upward slightly and so forth. And Harrison, uh, Jerison proposes that this led to the development of something really special, uh, a sense of map in the brains of these uh, primitive uh, mammals. And so the story went. Uh, and they managed to survive for 100 million years this way. And then, of course, we know the story, the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs. And suddenly, the mammals were no longer restricted to being underground. As always, kids went out of the tunnels, even though their parents said not to. And the kids found outside there, they didn't get eaten. It was this beautiful world. There was stuff to eat. Marvelous. And then more and more mammals came out and started living on the ground again. But now they had another problem. Living in caves for 100 million years, they just virtually lost their sense of sight. They couldn't see. And of course, what could be most valuable of senses when you're on the Earth's surface is the sense of vision. And so the mammals had to develop the visual system, redevelop it from scratch. And they had to do that. They had some remnants of photoreceptors in their head, uh, and they had to add a lot more information processing. So more stuff added to the front of this, and we end up with a great big uh, outgrowth of olfactory tissue getting bigger and bigger, growing further and further and further. And finally, all the way at the back of the brain, we have the occipital robe where the sense of vision is. It's furthest away because it got added last. Now, here comes the clincher. These mammals faced a problem that should never have been faced by any living organism. Uh, they had originally, as dinosaurs had, they had good hearing sense. They could find their way around. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. But now you had an animal that had super touch, super smell, super hearing, and on top of a mapping sense, and on top of that, it's a vision coming in. And Jerison says, these mammals suddenly, their problem was information overflow. You know about that? And he said that something remarkable happened at that point to manage that information overflow. And somehow, it all got packed into one thing and that's what consciousness is. So there's my answer, or what I feel is the best answer I've ever seen for the origin of consciousness. And it does tell you that, in a sense, that only mammals probably are conscious, and that lower animals are very good. They can learn, they can uh, react, and all these things, but they're not conscious. So we, we've seen the evolution then from a point of increasing sensory capacity to the point that they reach an o information overload. Information systems then begin to emerge in order to manage that information. And arousal that we haven't talked about, our attention also comes to play. We'll talk about that later. So how is consciousness then differ from intelligence? Ah, oh. one way of looking at intelligence that I come across really is uh, that um, you could define intelligence in a somewhat different way. Consider a game of chess. And you have one player who may take hundreds of hours examining the results of all the possible moves they can think of before he does anything. 
makes a move. Player two makes a move in less than five seconds. Which of the two would you regard as intelligent? And in many ways, I think that when we think about intelligence and intelligence of computers and artificial intelligence, yeah, it's uh, computers can do the, by examining all possibilities and so forth and so forth, are able to do things and solve problems, but one might really question, are they intelligent? Let me, let me I, I didn't think of asking this to you before. Uh, I, the player that made the move in five seconds, maybe it was just impulsive. It was almost reflexive knowing I gotta make a move, I'll make a move. I don't even think about it. Were you assuming that player two made a good move? That actually- Yes, I'm assuming he made a good move, okay. yes. Yeah, I, no. I thought I'd add that just to be no. sure. Right, uh, yeah, please. Some persons uh, specifically, and I think we've sent you a copy of his paper, this Yuval Noah Harari views consciousness no. as processing the capacity to suffer and therefore having significant ethical and political implications. Is, is conscious, is the word conscious and consciousness or conscience the same thing? Conscious, conscience, yeah. I think we'd have to distinguish between conscience and consciousness. Uh, That's almost what he's getting at when he's talking about uh, ethical but, or moral compass. I think he's added something to the concept yeah. of conscious. I, I, well, I wasn't clear about his, his focus on suffering. I, I took it really to mean as a very strong example of, of any kind of a subjective feeling, uh, which to me would include anger and hunger and uh, love or anything else that's a subjective feeling. And uh, it seems unlikely that these can exist without there being consciousness. Uh, but that, that, that would seem to be the prerequisite uh, to, yeah. to, to have a conscience and to, to display it, you need to have con to be conscious. So we need, we're dealing with two different concepts and maybe yeah. slightly in, in, somewhat interdependent, but I think conscience needs to be dealt with in a separate uh, a separate webinar because I have a conscience, uh, whether it be a, a computer who's been coded to have a moral, a moral compass, or a human being who on birth may have limited morality, but as a product of learning develops a conscience, even though they may have conscious in advance. Uh, I think they need to be looked at independently. And that, that was the critique of that particular uh, um, podcast that we read is we think we got he got conscience and consciousness confused. Anyway, as a student, you a student of, con of being conscious, or have you considered what role being conscious plays in personal and social behavior? Well, as far as pers personal behavior goes, it would seem to me that if you're not conscious, you don't have any, you don't have any self-identity. Uh, and uh, would your behavior and the behavior exhibit be considered, you know, sort of personal? Uh, the... Uh, one can wonder about uh, group behaviors of animals uh, and uh, these group behaviors uh, in terms of social behavior, uh, they can be produced and maintained by, by what we call instincts, they're built in. Behavior is, is part of the genetic code as much as uh, the structure of our bodies. And uh, these behaviors can be triggered by certain stimuli, touch, olfaction and so forth. We certainly, the examples of that in uh, in invertebrates. Uh, so uh, it depends really on uh, whether when using the term social, uh, if it includes a recognition of the identity and consciousness of the uh, others that are in the social group. Well, it certainly takes you into when you get into abnormal psychology. Uh, what is the consciousness of a psychopath or a sociopath? Yeah, you may, from a perspective of conscious, not appreciate the the uh, sensory input that they're getting of suffering and of another individual does not have the same emotional impact as it might on someone else. So I think we're then getting into this learned conscience versus conscious being conscious itself. In any case. You think yeah. AI could ever code suffering, ever codes consciousness for that matter. Uh, that is the capacity to be sentient, to feel, to be conscious, to have a conscious. And I'm not talking here about switches in a fact in, in, a, in a warehouse. I'm talking about the coding. Could we ever code AI to the point that it could simulate or could actually become conscious? 
Uh, but that's the cr critical word there. We could code it, I'm sure, to simulate both any kind of, of humor, emotion, uh, facial expressions, and everything else. Uh, but that still leaves open the question of uh, whether they, the computer actually is feeling those emotions that it's uh, simulating, or is it just a simulation? Well, you probably know where I'm going here with uh, behaviorism. <laughs> I mean, from the point of view of what behaviorism as a movement in psychology, they simply looked at the external output of human behavior and said, I, I'm, I'm now observing consciousness, I'm observing behavior. Uh, the computer has consciousness because it's demonstrating the same way a, a, a behavior, an organism is. So uh, it, it, if we restrict the word conscious to that which is biochemical, then of course the computer could never. But if we're looking at simulated behavior, one might say it's behaving like it's conscious when it's programmed accordingly. Anyway, just to be conscious is more than simply to be awake, more than to be, well, more than to be turned on. It, it is to be aware. It's conceivable that a computer could be programmed to simulate being conscious that is aware, but it would be real magic if it could actually learn to process, say, visual input to create images. Now we're into something else and even focus on what's important in those images. How does the brain do that? Well, we know that uh, there's a, there's, I receive a, oh, four times a year a industrial magazine called com essentially dealing with nothing but computer vision and automation. And it's remarkable uh, how uh, a computer can take a visual image and uh, interpret it, uh, find out specific things and make a correction, pro have a computer make computer automated, uh, make the uh, make the correcting movements. So uh, the way to address, the way I'd like to address the question of consciousness is by showing, first of all, to start with the physical properties of light and matter that makes possible an optical image of the world in the eye. And uh, to for us to consider that the image uh, that we have in our eye uh, realize that that is not the image that we see. Photons don't have any properties of, of having color. They're not bright. Uh, they're just uh, vibrating bundles of electromagnetic energy. And uh, the amount of their energy depends on the frequency of their vibration. The image that you have in your eye to start with, uh, of course, is uh, also when you make that image, you invariably uh, end up having uh, an image that's upside down. Uh, the image on your eye is upside down, and this certainly perplexed early scholars, and they tried to twist optics around to, to make it come out the right way. Uh, one might wonder, you know, well, couldn't it just be solved by if the optic nerve itself, sort of as it went from the eye to the brain, you sort of twist it around a bit and where it hooked up. That's not the answer. And by remarks on remarkable experiments, people have worn special glasses that turn the world upside down. And sure enough, the world, when you turn the world upside down, the image in the retina is right side up, but the world looks upside down, at least for a day or two. And then they wake up one morning and the world is right side up when they're wearing the glasses. And so it continues. When they then take off their glasses, for the first while, the world is upside down again until suddenly it turns right side up. This shows you some remarkable things about what consciousness is really doing with respect to that image in our eye. There's a simple demonstration you can make to show yourself a little bit of the difference between uh, what the red image on your eye and what you actually experience, it will show it a little bit. Now, if you were to look, close one eye, maybe it'll be easier to do, uh, but not necessarily. It'll be easier to do it with one eye and just sort of look straight ahead and look up and look down. Look up and look down. Now, when you look up and down, the image on your back, your retina moves down and then up. But the room stays where it is. 
even though the image in your eye is moving up and down. How does it do that? Well, it's clearly doing something because here's, here's the test. Now, take with one eye closed and take a finger and put it underneath your lower eyelid. And now jiggle your eye up and down. The image is moving up and down mm -hmm. on your retina. And now the room is moving up and down as well. That's because under normal circumstances, when you move your eye up and down, the brain visual system knows that you're moving your eye up and down and it corrects for it. But it hasn't been wired to correct for moving your finger uh, and uh, compensating the movement of the image in that way. So some of the other things that are different about the, uh, uh, the image in your eye, it's a very poor quality uh, of uh, image. You'd never be able to sell a camera like that. That's because the photons, uh, when they enter your eye, they first have to pass through a lens. Now this lens isn't made of sharp, clear glass. It's made of a bunch of cells that are sort of pretty transparent. Uh, then it has to pass through uh, several centimeters of an organic fluid, which isn't perfectly clear. That's, that's but the then when it hits the back of the eye, the first thing it hits are blood vessels. And below the blood vessels are a bunch of nerve cells, the nerve cells that make up the optic nerve. And only when it's gone through all that does it hit the receptors. And the receptors are sitting facing the wrong way. They're facing out towards the back of the eye. So the light has to go all the way through the receptor before it hits the photosensitive uh, molecules in the receptor cells. But making a picture worse yet is that you have a hundred million of these photoreceptors in the back of your eye, but you have only one million nerve cells to carry the information from the uh, of that image back to the rest of the brain. Uh, and, and in a way, that's fortunate because if your optic nerve was uh, had a hundred million nerve fibers in it, it'd be almost as thick as your wrist, and you wouldn't have room going into the brain for much else. Uh, to have surface to enter the brain. So uh, the image uh, suffers further. However, despite all that, uh, we can see details that are finer than the individual size of the receptors at the back of our eye. How does it do that? Well. Same way, information processing. One of the uh, theories of perception that we learned about in graduate school, J.J. Gibson. Uh, he said, oh, you don't have to worry about a whole bunch of stuff about the, the eye and how stuff like that works. He said, this is all very straightforward. He pointed out the geometry of the world is logical. The lies of light travel straight. Uh, what's the problem? The problem is that out in the real world, there are no images. Uh, most services and most of what we see, we don't really see uh, photons in our eyes or in, in our image. We see surfaces. So everything we see is a, that we see is a surface that's reflected light. A few things actually are sources of light, but most of it is surfaces. And surfaces reflect light in all directions. And so uh, what you have is this array in a particular room of beams and rays of light going in all directions all over the place. So in order to obtain some type of an organized representation of outs there, you'd have to sort every photon in terms of direction where it would came from. And uh, that would start uh, require some enormous computer with uh, thousands and thousands of receptors doing the calculations. So the challenge we've now set up is we understand there's photons coming into the eye, reaching the retina with 100 million receptors, going into an optic nerve, but somehow we haven't yet gotten to how does the brain actually create an image 
Um, we've talked about the chaos that's now uh, coming into the brain and somehow this, as you call it, information processing does occur. So can you take us further? What exactly is the image? Well, okay, so an image in, in a way is that you can look into being a map, a map. And it's a map uh, where uh, the arriving photons uh, are where the photons originally came from, uh, mapped out onto uh, some sort of a two-dimensional surface. Because uh, photons travel in straight lines and rays, all you really need to do is determine the direction from which they arrived. And uh, there it turns out that you don't need a giant computer to do this. There's a very much simpler solution. And that simpler solution, now we get into some of the physics. Uh, and this is physics relates to the speed of light. Uh, everyone, most people know the speed of light is sort of supposedly sort of constant. 300,000 kilometers a second, and it doesn't matter where, what direct, what, uh, from where you measure it, but that's only in a vacuum or uh, in air where there aren't any, where the atoms are too sparse to interfere with the passage of light. But when photons enter a denser medium like water uh, or a glass, uh, their, their photons electromagnetic field uh, is retarded by the uh, negative fields of the electrons around those atoms. And the denser the medium, the more this slows down their speed. So here we have the example of uh, a, a photon coming in, hitting a dense material, a piece of glass like a prism, but an interesting thing is that part of that photon enters the glass before the rest of it does. So it gets slowed down. And the effect is much like what you might have had if you uh, were skiing and one of your skis go out of the track into the snow or softer snow, and suddenly you swerve into the deep snow. Or, uh, and that's exactly what happens to the photon. So it swerves. When the photon leaves a surface at a slant, Part of the photon exits faster before the other part. It speeds up. And so once again, you get a further change in the direction in which the photon is traveling. Now, if you're clever, you could make a couple of prisms shaped like this and like this and like this. And with those prisms, what you'd be able to do, you'd be able to take light that was spreading out at least three rays of it, like so from some source here and put them all back together over here. Uh, and thus you produced a map here of a point there. And uh, you could add more prisms. And if you keep adding prisms, it ends up that there's a really neat solution. Just any curved surface will do the same thing. And the degree of curvature depends on just where those arrays of light we brought back together to single points. And but the geometry of it is such that invariably the image you get is upside down. So you have an image, then that's how you can get an image in the eye. But there is a further problem. And this takes us back to another interesting law of physics. This one everybody understands, even though they may not be familiar with the name. It's the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, what it really means is that you can't put two things in the same place at the same time. But uh, things, photons are not things. They're pure energy. So they can disobey Pauli's exclusion principle, which again is very fortunate. Because if we're not for the exclusion principle, what we would see would just be single rays of light just sort of spread out all over. There's so many of them coming in, so many angles that all you'd have would be a sort of a very, very dim grayness. But because they can pile up in some places and not other places, depending on how bright the, the uh, point was that originally released them, you can now get differences in the 
uh, intensity of the image and now have something that you can, with some information that's useful. The next question is, well, so you have these photons of, of uh, diff clusters of different densities at the back of the eye. And now you have another problem. How do photons affect matter? In a little bit, it's like sort of a little bit like the hard question, isn't it? How does a bunch of electrical activity produce, you know, somehow an image? Well, how do photons affect, affect matter? It's just pure energy. Well, here we, of course, we have the answer. Um, and uh, the energy of a photon, it's, it's, it's related to uh, its wavelength. And the way that a photon can affect matter is by committing suicide. Namely, by giving up all its energy ceases to exist to an electron. Now, these electrons that are electron that's orbiting a nucleus of an atom, and it's very almost always the outer electron in the outer shell, they're called valence electrons. Uh, and when the electron absorbs this energy, it kicks the electron out into a higher orbit. Now, when the electron goes into a higher orbit, this can cause the atom to lose its place amongst its neighbors. In other words, atoms are not lovely atoms within a molecule are lovely and balanced by attraction and, and repulsion of charge amongst themselves. And if you change the location of a charge on one, you sort of jiggle things around and you have changed the molecule itself. So receptor cells have evolved molecules they have in their cell membrane, which uh, uh, can have their change can be altered uh, by absorbing photons of certain wavelengths. And the effect of, of this change in these types of neurons is that it causes them to release or change the release of a neurotransmitter substance. And now you have the beginnings of uh, neural activity. Now, it's a bit more selective than that. Uh, all matter vibrates. Uh, and the wavelength of that vibration, everything in the universe vibrates. And its wavelength is inversely related to its mass. Uh, now, electrons are restricted around in their orbits around atoms to orbits that are stable. Uh, and what, in other words, there are standing waves. And an orbit electron will be in a standing wave when the circumference of its orbit equals a whole number of its de Broglie wavelengths, its natural frequency wavelengths. The closest an atom uh, electron can go to an atom is within one an orbit that's one wavelength in circumference. And in fact, it's that which stops the electron from actually getting absorbed into the positively charged nucleus. It's sitting there vibrating. It can't get any closer, but it can get kicked further out. But uh, it can only be kicked out to certain particular orbits that are multiples of its wavelength. Uh, that means that how far it gets kicked depends on the photon's energy. So only certain energy levels of photons, in other words, certain wavelengths, will get absorbed. Others will just be kicked back out, as illustrated in the diagram here. So this helps us appreciate the impact that a photon can have on electrons in the receptor itself. But that doesn't really tell us about how, for example, we can get color. Can you take us a little bit deeper into how this principle of this observation takes us a little bit closer to what the elements are in an image? Okay. Uh, so we know that the um, um, photons don't have color of themselves. Uh, in fact, it would be nice if they did. It makes things a whole lot simpler, wouldn't it? So uh, the thing is that because only certain types of molecules will absorb certain wavelengths, it also tells you uh, that what wavelengths a molecule absorbs or molecules reflect 
are a direct indicator of what these molecules really are. It identifies the substance. That's how we know what distant stars are made of. We read what sort of wavelengths of light they emit. So this uh, is a real advantage, it turned out to be a real advantage for primates and squirrels, which live in trees. Uh, and uh, one of the problems that they sort of face living in trees was they want to look and find food in another tree. Now, getting down on the ground and running across the other tree can be dangerous because there are a lot of critters out there that are just looking for that. And rather than take the risk, it would be a great advantage that they could tell whether there was fruit on another tree and whether that fruit was edible or not. And so for that reason, primates in particular have evolved a particularly good, for mammals that is, a particularly good uh, sense of vision of being able to discriminate different wavelengths of light on the basis of that making decisions, such as you see in the, in the diagrams here. This would be an uh, apple tree, uh, where you could, which there's no, no wavelength discrimination is occurring. And here we see one with a wavelength uh, discrimination by uh, mechanisms such as uh, mammals have. How they achieve this uh, is that they have three different kinds of uh, photoreceptor molecules and receptors of their eyes, uh, different receptors having different photochemical molecules. So uh, different nerves carry the information from uh, either short, middle, or long wavelength uh, photons. They're not tightly uh, tuned, but that turns out to be an advantage and that will require a lot more explanation. Uh, on the basis of these, th these three, with the middle and long wavelengths fairly closely overlapping, you do enough information processing, and even though these overlap closely, you end up getting very distinct effects, uh, subjective difference between a long wavelength, what long wavelength photons produce, a red, a red, which actually is more akin to the wavelength out here at around 650 nanometers. The green is about the same, the blue in the blue region. Uh, the curve in the middle here, shows you the ability to tell differences in the wavelength of light. This is from uh, some observers from my laboratory. And the scale for the black here, the difference thresholds, uh, is over here on the right-hand side. And we see here that uh, in a particular region of the spectrum, uh, we're able to tell differences of less than two nanometers uh, in wavelength. Under optimal conditions, you can actually go even somewhat better than that. So this is what the information processing is doing. But then, of course, there's still the question. Uh, that information is kept uh, in separate nerves and more information processing done further in the cortex. Much of this happens right in the eye itself. Uh, I said. Primates and squirrels have three photoreceptors. Most mammals have only one or two. This is what that tree would look like <clears throat> to uh, a mammal that has only two kinds of photoreceptors. Uh, they, they better not be dependent on apples for, uh, for finding their, their food, have trouble. So there are some questions here, of course, that. Uh, the answers would make some interesting stories themselves. Uh, why is it just primates and squirrels, but tree dwellers? Uh, so by living in a tree, somehow, if we go back one slide to those receptor curves that we had, if that's easy to do, yeah, uh, mammals have a single uh, photoreceptor that's right in between here. And some mutation took place that split that gene into two variations. And that's what that little split makes the difference between having receptors set, two, two types of receptors, one to middle and one to longer wavelength light. Okay, well, what about brightness? Let's jump, jump on a little bit. I mean, this has been phenomenal to understand that of the 100 million photoreceptors we have in the eye, uh, that we've got actually some differentiation between some that 
absorb one wavelength versus another that give us the capability to actually discern color. But what about brightness itself? Okay. Uh, so brightness, you face uh, a very different sort of problem. Uh, uh, how do you cope uh, with the enormous range of brightness levels that we find in the world around us? I mean, it's a factor of something like a billion to one. Uh, and you want to be able to operate effectively, uh, both uh, in full daylight, uh, as well as things get down towards um, uh, dusk and so forth. Uh, now, the problem is that, remember, the information that is carried in single nerve cells is the frequency of firing. Nerve cells are rather limited in how rapidly they can fire. They can change their firing rate by only about a factor of 100 to 1. So the brain visual system uses a bunch of mechanisms uh, to sort of uh, help uh, spread that. But one I think is particularly neat uh, is what we're showing you here. Uh, the visual system seems to have a, repertoire, a limited repertoire of sort of brightness effects it can produce. This seems to be built in. Just like there's that good evidence to indicate that we're built in the repertoire of different colors we can produce. Now, you have this limited repertoire, and so how's it going to do? Cope. What it does is, as it goes to different levels of brightness, it takes this palette and it just simply slides it over. And you've noticed this yourself. Uh, when you look at stuff uh, standing out in the sun, you look at stuff in the dark under a tree, you can't see much underneath there. But move underneath the tree, you can see lots of differences that you couldn't see from outside the tree because your brain has shifted this palette over to the level of lighting that's under the tree. Uh, then, of course, if you look outside, it looks glaringly bright because uh, now things are out here, but this hasn't shifted out there yet because you're in here. So that's, a, to me, a really neat way of uh, example of, of the brain using and creating uh, subjective effects and how one of the things it does to uh, optimally manage that those subjective effects depending on the conditions in which we find ourselves. Hey, one, one more feature then of images is that sometimes they're blurry uh, and yet the brain seems to have the capability of discerning what they're looking at even though the image may be somewhat blurry. It's, it's adding something in this information processing. How, how is this corrected? How is the, the blurriness disappeared so it becomes somewhat concrete or, or known? Okay, so there, there is a, some neat mechanisms taking place uh, in the eye. Uh, Skip, you can show example here of a, a blurry optical image that shows you what will happen when a bright source it becomes particularly evident, and we've experienced this at night. Now, we've experienced it at night partly when driving in fog, but this is not in fog. You'll notice the stars are sharply clear. Some of the details off to the side are, are, uh, are quite clear. Uh, this, is, uh, this blurring is due to blurring in the eye itself, uh, the lens of the eye in particular, uh, Many, some of you may have had an operation for cataracts where you've had the lens of your eye replaced because it's clouded and so forth. Now, uh, to correct for, the eye has learned to correct for some of the more ordinary blurring that occurs due to uh, the structure of the retina itself. Uh, and here we have an example of uh, a real sharp event out in the real world and when it gets to the retina, it's spread out like this. Now, in the retina itself, you find interconnections uh, between the different photoreceptors. And these interconnections act as what negative feedback, the engineers may be familiar with this in your audience, it affects some negative feedback on one and another. And what happens in a situation like this is you get a sort of a, a winner take all. The strongest one gets through, and uh, the others get sort of diminished. And as a result, what gets sent to the cortex is a much sharper pattern of activity across the different nerve cells uh, than the image on the retina. Interesting, fascinating. The brain can perceive shapes too. That's the last item we're to refer to because this is, this is sort of where the real magic comes in, the capability to actually 
perceive a shape. That's true, yes. So to carry the information from, uh, even from 100 million neurons to different areas of the brain in the visual system, uh, and also for uh, processing color, direction, distance, uh, also to other areas of the brain so that you can involve memory, uh, recognition, emotion, content, uh, control the motor movements as you're seeing them and so forth. Uh, if you were sending a hundred million, uh, sorry, even a million nerve cells in all of these directions, again, you wouldn't have any room for anything else in the brain. So the information has to be compressed or transformed even further, and it is. And one so, of the first, so, so it goes first to the visual cortex. So it goes first to the visual cortex. Right. And when we, by 1964, they had developed the technology so that you could record for single cells in the visual cortex. And then they discovered something completely different. Uh, they found that the cells of the visual cortex were no longer sensitive to different spots on the retina. They were sensitive to lines uh, and edges. Uh, they also found that the color information was processed separately. Uh, and uh, this very quickly then led to a sort of a coloring book type theory of how a visual image was created. That uh, a bunch of, of uh, uh, lines like this would be put together to uh, form uh, outlines and images and the brain would fill in the rest. We're not there yet, but we're about to get there. <laughs> then four years later, another experiment took place that revolutionized the whole picture again. This, however, was not done by recording from the brain. It started with some vision experiments. And these vision experiments seem to indicate that the visual sensitivity was due not to sensitive to lines particularly, but to the spacing of lines, how far apart or close together, how fine they were, uh, and so forth. Now, when you these sorts of patterns really amount to frequencies uh, in space. And it turns out that uh, this is uh, somewhat difficult to explain. And uh, given that the coloring book theories look so nice, there was good cortical evidence. At first, this evidence, visual evidence, was received with a lot of skepticism. It took several years before uh, there began to come in direct evidence that there were also cells further in the visual cortex that were in fact sensitive and tuned to spatial frequencies. Now, the implications of that uh, require an understanding of what's called Fourier transforms. And, uh, but here I can illustrate to you the idea. What you had is, uh, you had a bunch of cells here, sensitive to lines. Now it took a tremendous amount Imagine the wiring it would took place to go from spot to spot to spot here in the optic nerve to create single cells sensitive to lines. Well, the same sort of transformation again occurs going from the first area of the visual cortex to the deeper areas of the visual cortex in order to produce cells that are sensitive to a whole bunch of lines all together and at different orientations. Uh, now, the analysis of an image into spatial frequencies is something that had been known for a long time. It was used in optics to analyze optical system. Uh, but what is also interesting is that uh, this is also the basis of what's called holography. Uh, and holography then can use Fourier type optics in order to take uh, a bunch of uh, such spatial frequencies and put it together to make images. Now, to do this demonstration, it, it might take a bit of time, but I think you, you can sort of perhaps believe it if it doesn't work right away. What you would do in this situation is you close one eye, well, you can have both eyes open and if you got good uh, coordination and stare at uh, the long bar in the middle here on the left side. 
and you look at that, let your eye wander back and forth a little bit, keep staring and staring and staring and staring and staring. You should do that for maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Takes a long time, we sit in there doing nothing. Or just drinking. And then suddenly switch over to this side. And if you've adapted your eyes enough, you realize that the bars up and down above and below are no longer exactly the same. The ones up above a little bit closer together, the ones down below a little bit further apart. That's because you have, by staring at this, you weaken pathways that are sensitive to high spatial frequencies, and here you weaken pathways that are sensitive to low spatial frequencies. There's still, <coughs> so when you go here, the low spatial frequencies are not kicking in, and thus these appear closer together. Here, the high spatial frequencies are not kicking in, and thus these appear further apart. So, uh, holograms. I thought I'd show you what real holograms look like, and I found this remarkable thing sent to me by a professor down in New Mexico. Best demonstration I've seen. This is what a hologram of simple patterns like letters actually look like. And <coughs> you can take this letter, Fourier analyze into spatial frequencies, superimpose them, and you get this. Now, if you do the reverse process, you get exactly the same thing back again. This is Fourier analysis. This is Fourier synthesis. And as you see, depending on the letter, you get very different Fourier holograms as a result. You see so a the brain, the brain is actually, the, the hypothesis or the theory is that the brain is actually creating, with all of that visual input, a hologram from that visual. That's the theory. That now, we know that the brain is producing the spatial frequency stuff. There's no doubt about that. We record that in the brain. Now, why would it do that? Except for the fact that holograms are the most efficient known way of storing large amounts of information. And so the brain at some point wants to remember this stuff, uh, work with it, and so on. Now, one of the neat things that uh, uh, about holograms is that if you take something like an image of a room and you Fourier analyze it to something like this. Here's your hologram. Then if you take just a small piece of that hologram and you Fourier synthesize it, put it back together again, you get the whole picture. You don't just get the little part of the room that's down in this corner. Here you get the whole picture, but it's just blurrier. The smaller the piece, the blurrier the image. A uh, man named uh, Carl Prebram whose lectures you also attended at Alberta. He gave a series of lectures in which he developed this theory about how um, Fourier synthesis was used by the visual system in order to create images. Uh, and one of the things that he said convinced him was this aspect of about holograms that a small piece reproduces the whole thing. And he said, that's much like how memory works. And that makes a lot of sense uh, because you don't have, you can't store endless amounts of information in memory, but if you get enough of this, well, you may from memory and so forth, fill in the details later and so on and so forth. Uh, so some, what would I call it, anecdotal evidence perhaps? Uh, the brain is really doing this. So it's quite a jump from uh, this linear and some of the uh, photoceptor and, and mag magnetic processing to actually do a Fourier analysis. So we're making a bit of a jump there of assuming hypothetically that what the brain is doing is taking that information and creating a Fourier, doing a Fourier analysis on it. And that is what actually creates the image. That's quite a jump. It is quite a jump. And yet the way these anal analyses are done uh, it is, in fact, uh, a matter of, we're familiar with doing mathematical correlations, uh, and it largely involves doing correlations among frequencies. The, the mathematics is very similar to, to that of doing the mathematical correlations, and these can be, uh, they can be simulated with NERM networks. So here we are, a biochemical event simulating what a computer does, 
which is Fourier analysis, that's where you use computing. The brain seems to have that computing capability. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's uh, one more, not another aspect about uh, the Fourier transform space and the efficiency with which it can work. Uh, on our left, we see the picture of the room. It's been Fourier analyzed. In the middle, we see a dinner plate, and it's been Fourier analyzed. Now, in Fourier analysis, it's very simple to put stuff together. You might think of it some way akin to logarithms. So if you got a lot of numbers to work with, convert them to logarithms. You can do the stuff in logarithms, then you transform back again, and you got an answer you can use. And in some way, it's similar to uh, how Fourier analysis works because you can simply add these two holograms together uh, to this. And then when you synthesize it, there is the dinner on the plate in the table. Phenomenal. OK, so how, so to this point, we've learned how the brain actually creates an image. I mean, this is awesome. But we haven't explored how, as a conscious being, we are able to recognize and being aware of that image. So I have the image. But I mean, I've been I had a aphasia for a while when I was in college. We were reading War and Peace. I was overloaded. I could see an image, but I couldn't tell you what it was of. It was bizarre. So somehow the brain has that capability of seeing an image and knowing what it is. This gets heavy, but let's let's go there. Right. Yeah. Well, this is what's been referred to as the, the, the sort of the hard problem. Uh, how does neural activity of any kind? Uh, possibly result in, in consciousness. And uh, this can be consciousness from the picture in the head that we've been talking about. But uh, it's equally clear, uh, certainly the way uh, Carl Priebram talks about it, that he, he refers to uh, similar sort of processing with respect to other sensory effects, uh, sound and touch, for example. And, uh, and you have to be able to account for awareness, for memory, feelings and emotions, all that can somehow be added together. Um, so uh, one of the things, of course, then is uh, besides this taking place, uh, there's also requires the attention, uh, which is where you could perhaps tell us something about uh, your work, Barry. Well, in, indeed, this, let, let's ignore that slide for, for a moment. We're going to get to that in a second. So okay. if you'll bear with me just for a moment. It, in, indeed, this was my area of research. I mean, we're, we're going back a long while ago, but Jesus was I press him. Uh, because I was, I was involved in the research on the systems of attention. And, and I'm going to comment on its relevance to all of what we've been talking about. To be awake uh, is just not enough. Uh, we've seen that an image can get generated, but that doesn't mean we, whoever we and that little person in our head are, uh, know, knows what that image is all about. So while that image exists is not enough, the missing function is awareness, general awareness. So to be generally aware is to be receptive. But attention is much more specific. Attention would take out of that array of all that optical input that you're getting right now, only something, maybe my voice or the image. Is getting, is getting through. All the rest is being filled out. Some place in the brain, interestingly enough, is, is called the thalamus probably, can be selective and take out what's important in that image from what's not important or not relevant based on your emotion or your memory. So you can you can see the, the amount of interaction that is going on between what Tommy has referred to as a visual input going to the optical uh, occipital lobe. And that information then goes elsewhere into the brain that says whether or not that image is relevant emotionally, experientially, or whatever. That's called attention. Very specific, the brain has the capability of doing it. The brain has the capability to draw on emotion and memory to be selective, to filter out input and output, differentiate them based on what is relevant. It's, it's an amazing instrument. Enough said. Let's go on further. It takes us what back to, back to the well. Enough said. I don't want to go back to the the brain's autonomy and uh, or anatomy and get into the reticular formation of the thalamus and all those interactions. But it, it does exist. It is a system independent of consciousness itself. Consciousness is is awareness. We've talked about the visual image coming into the brain and how an actual image gets generated, which is then transmitted to other areas of the brain that look for something important. 
that that is a phenomenal uh, uh, opportunity for maybe another webinar. But Tommy, I'm going to go back to you on how the brain actually does create the, those images. Well, in a way, uh, we don't really know yet. Uh, this is the the best or the first uh, level of explanation uh, that I've seen so far. So there have been, you know, now for some 20 years, people have been doing recordings of the brain and finding certain patterns of activity in a certain part of the brain when a person sees something or smells something and so forth. And that's marvelous, all done. But somehow it still doesn't tell you, ah, where does the consciousness come from? It's just, it's, it's, cor it's, it's correlational evidence. Uh, just published this month is, is a, a uh, paper by Jakob Kemmler that I get somewhat of a rough idea of, of uh, his theory of what is happening. And uh, uh, his theory uh, is that you have uh, inputs into columns of cells that we saw in the earlier figures and they could be sensitive to space, different spatial frequencies and so forth. Uh, and uh, in these columns, standing electromagnetic fields are produced. And that's, uh, they're being produced in here by the vibration of uh, molecules, uh, receptor molecules within, amongst the, the nerve cells here. And they vibrate back and forth, vibrating back and forth, changing shape, produces standing electromagnetic waves. And standing electromagnetic waves in one region will gradually build up and spread to adjacent columns. And uh, Kepler's theory suggests that it is in this electromagnetic field here that you have the opportunity for complex interactions of various frequencies all at the same time uh, which then provides you at least one step further going from neural activity to complex electromagnetic fields. Of course, we still haven't solved the problem. Well, how does the complex electromagnetic field produce this picture in your head? Uh, but I think that Kepler has maybe softened the hard problem a little bit. So thank you again, Tommy. Uh, we've learned more uh, and, uh, than I ever expected through the week that we've been uh, together putting all of this together. Uh, for those of you that want to read more and, and learn more from a very readable source, it's a little bit early yet. It hasn't yet come out, but uh, you can at least get a glimpse of it on Amazon. The book's called, as we noted early on in the uh, today, uh, A Glance at the Dance of Photo Photons. But now it's your turn. Uh, I, I see most of you have just been generally paying attention to the, these awesome moments, uh, but it is your turn if you've got any questions of Tom and or any comments to make. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it over to you and look for hand, hands now. Uh, any comments out there? I know in the chat there was some question about the, the distinction between the conscious and the subconscious and maybe what's the autom autonomic nervous system where it's all happening on a reflexive basis. Have you ever, any views at all or any thoughts in your dreams or in your research labs about the concept of what's subconscious? Or is it simply just another level of the same thing that happens when we're uh, we're asleep or we're, we're not quite awake? Or it's happening all the time, but it's just not something we're aware of? Well, all this processing that I've been talking about is occurring subconsciously. We're not aware of the fact that, that we're shifting the grayscale up and down and we're not aware of the computations uh, going from uh, lines to edges and so forth and so on. Uh, so, and of course, with all the other stuff uh, about maintaining heart rate and uh, digestive system, everything, you know, all, all subconscious processing. And it should be because my gosh, do you want to think about, you know, not inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Uh, we got two centers, the way down in the very bottom of our brain there, that uh, trigger one and you go, ah, trigger the other one. Ah. Uh, well, of course, that's sort of boring. So you get a little more complex animal uh, and uh, then you trigger something, it goes faster and you trigger the other side, it goes slower. But we were not aware of any of that. And those animals probably are not aware of any of that either. 
Uh, so yeah, there's lots of subconscious processing. Well, and we we saw in the nervous system that that reptilian brain or the the core brain is basically a sensory sensory brain. It's not necessarily an intelligent or interpretive brain. It's more about reflex. You would certainly talk about that as being subconscious. That the animals at that level may only possess that level of awareness which is really not what we think of as awareness. It, it's simply being re receptive for a reflex. Right. Uh, an amoeba is behaving by reflex. It isn't yet necessarily doing any interpreting of what's in its environment. It's only responding or not to the environment. It's got one or two options, go, go, fight, or, fight, or, fight or flight. Um, Jeff, you've got your hand up. I, I've got an experience that um, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. When I was younger, I did a... A drive in in the city of Calgary from, you know, Thirty Third Avenue to uh, McMahon, uh, McMahon Stadium, and I was tired. And I got to McMahon Stadium and realized that I hadn't, I, I couldn't remember getting there. So basically, I'd been driving the whole time um, on autopilot, I guess. And uh, because I was tired, and you know, something got rerouted in my brain. So even though I was able to, you know, manage driving through regular you know rush hour traffic it uh it wasn't registering in my long-term memory so i wonder if you have any comments about that yeah, i'd like to report you to the police you can't keep on driving <laughs> like that <laughs> i didn't get into an accident <laughs> but, I mean, we, we are talking about uh, attention and uh and whether or not we can actually be performing acts without being aware that we're performing them you ever play the piano Haley? Uh, you and I just yesterday were having a discussion about when you play the piano, are you always aware of what every freaking finger is doing or something is just done on automatic pilot when you've learned it well enough? Do you really have to pay that much attention to it? Haley, do you want to comment your experience as a teacher in the in the piano business? Uh, I, I pulled this up because I need help remembering because consciousness. So there's this new theory of consciousness by a doctor in Boston, his name is Dr. Budson. And he says, in a nutshell, our theory is that consciousness developed as a memory system that is used by our unconscious brain to help us flexibly and creatively imagine the future and plan accordingly. And Perry will know why I, why I love that quote. But then he says, um, what, what is completely new about that theory is that it suggests we don't perceive the world, make decisions or perform actions directly. Instead, we do all these things unconsciously. And then about a half second later, consciously remember doing them, mm -hmm. which answers your question, Perry. This is what I would say. Uh, I would throw my hat into that ring as, uh, as a pianist. You do things in the future, you premeditate doing them and then you recall doing them. So you're holding three levels of consciousness simultaneously. That's uh, my experience. For anyone who has either been under hypnosis or knows anything about hypnosis, this is really what it's very much about is th this phenomenal capability of this organ that we carry on our head that we have no idea how it works. But if you've ever studied it and seen what it is capable of doing, read a book sometime about hypnosis and see the phenomenal things that the brain can be doing when, when instructed it's it's better believe it or not than gpt i say that in humor but uh, it, it's, it's current humor and it's dark not dark by any means but it, it is phenomenal and tom i don't know whether or not you in in the course of your uh, formal or informal uh, career that you've actually discussed or seen or had a dialogue with anyone about the capability of the brain beyond just perception. I mean, we've seen people that can memorize uh, what, what pi is equal to to the thousandth level. The, the brain can be organized to do absolutely phenomenal things. And I've been in awe of what Tommy has been telling us about today, about these 100 million receptors and what, the, what, what goes on in, a, in the blink of an eye to eliminate half of what we're looking at right now. So I'm just looking at, at Haley's earrings. And I'm seeing her earrings, but I'm seeing nothing else. Okay, anybody else got any other question? Tom, do you want to comment here at all? Tell me. Well, uh, all right. Uh, I've heard playing uh, an instrument is like being in a time machine. Right. What you're hearing at the moment is what you've already done. Yeah. 
what you're doing, you don't know because you're thinking about what you're going to do next, which is very much what I think Haley was sort of driving at. And, and that takes you back to something we referred to earlier in the discussion, which is, is the brain very often just observing what we are doing, what whoever we is, that, that it's a parallel process. It's an epiphenomenon. It's an, it's an emergent property that there are elements of awareness that we are working not, not reflexively, but what, what, through our habits and through our emotion and through our needs, our, our body, our mind is acting. And we have this thing called awareness watching what all is going on, but not having direct influence. It's possible, but it's, it's, it's quite amazing because it, it takes us into free will. Are we really free at all? Or are we just observing what our body thinks it's capable of doing, which is really drawn from our DNA and our experiences? Anybody else out there? Yeah, I mean, I've got so many questions. I don't know where to start. But when uh, I think it was, it was talking. Well, how, how's, how's 20 to 5 or 20 to 6? Let's okay. start there. Well, um, I, I did have an experience of uh, transient global amnesia once. And um, my, my wife took me to the hospital and they couldn't figure out what was going on. At, for six hours, I was talking to her and other s staff. I have no memory of that whatsoever. Uh, and after s about six hours, I came to consciousness, uh, sitting right and in the like in the middle of a conversation. Uh, so I, I asked my own doctor later what was going on. Was I conscious? during that time well i certainly have memory of it my doctor thought that i was in fact probably conscious i i don't know how to explain this uh, experience though well people people have talked about and someone i was referring to this week as we were getting ready we we're having this conversation about consciousness was explaining that uh they were at a point unconscious but someone said something in a room that was very relevant to them and all of a sudden they woke up now, were they conscious? Well, somehow whatever was going in was going in, but it wasn't being processed. But when something very relevant happened, it woke them up. So the brain's capable of doing that. They, 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 they talk about someone un unconscious through anesthesia in surgery. Are they hearing what's going on? They may not be feeling, but are they hearing what's going on? Do they have a memory of that surgical experience? I can recall at university losing the capability to interpret words that I was seeing, the words lost meaning. There are many, many processes going on in the brain that we're, we have no idea how they're occurring. And through the magic of what, or through, through Tommy's explanation, at least today, we've got a, a deeper insight to what is happening visually, simply with what the eye does uh, as it makes it, as the information makes its way up into the brain to create an image that we still are not quite sure how that image gets recognized into something with color and, and physical presence in our brain. I was talking to Klaus Rodenberg the other day, was saying he doesn't have those images in color or he doesn't have those images at all. You mentioned yeah. Eiffel Tower, something jumps into your head. He doesn't have that phenomenon. So something in our brain actually creates the images, but you, you don't, you're not dead if you don't have that. That's just another phenomenon that the brain is in fact generating. Absolutely fascinated by your talk today, Tommy. Um, professor, you know, I just uh, had forgotten just how some of this stuff uh, I sort of understood years ago and how much further you've gone with it and to explain these processes, which most of us have no clue are even happening to us at the present time. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Yeah, we've got you. It's going into my auditory system and then up to the temporal lobe and interpreting <laughs> the words and I, etc. I'm not going to give you all right. of it. Yeah, so I, I'm just, uh, you know, I have been hypnotized a few times um, and I found that a really interesting experience. And uh, again, that sort of delves into areas that a lot of people have no clue about. And, and the other area that is memory, you know, and Harry, you and I talked about it the other day of the biochemical aspect of memory. We just really don't know that much about it. Maybe Tommy could explain a bit about that too. Or maybe not. No, I, I, yeah. I can't explain about the biochemical basis of memory, but I have done one experiment uh, which tells us something about memory that uh, really hasn't been 
found by, by the researchers. Uh, and that is, uh, we did some experiments using what in, uh, in uh, vision, uh, visual experiments we call second order effects. Second order effects, instead of measuring your sensitivity to something, you measure the sensitivity to differences. And from those differences, it's possible to do back calculations using some really simple calculus to estimate what the original sensory message was. And so people have estimated the shapes of those color curves that I showed you are from directly from that sort of difference threshold function that you saw on the same graph accurately. So many years ago, it occurred to me to wonder if, if that would work for studying memory. And I've done over a series of some 20 years experiments on measuring difference thresholds for very simple stimuli that not just ordinary sensory difference thresholds, but memory difference thresholds. And you would have a person look at something like I used a lot of it with color because you can measure color very accurately using monochromators. You can measure very accurately what color a person remembers by having to adjust the wavelength of a monochromator to match the color that they saw. And then you can measure the accuracy of their memory in terms of the difference between the wavelength you show them and the wavelength that they match the two. These experiments take a long time to do. A student would work for me for an entire summer to make enough measurement because they're very tedious to do. You sit there in the dark and nothing happens for you know, the length of the memory time. And then you, for a second, you see a flash. And then you sit there and do nothing. And then you see another flash. And then you have to remember, adjust that second flash till it matches the wavelength or matches the color as you see it of the first flash over and over and over again. And if you do that over and over again, you get very reliable results. You get results that even different people will produce similar results. Now, what I then did was I calculated from those different thresholds what would be uh, the pattern of activity coming out of memory. And those different thresholds had a remarkable characteristic. The difference thresholds had a complex function, uh, much like you saw when they were looking at the colors directly. And what you get the same complex function indicates that what came out of memory must be very similar to the sensory messages that came when they were looking at that color. That's what I can tell you about memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it's stored, but I have. This to me seems like a clue as to when we use our memory, what comes out of it. I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm going to, Haley, you've got your hand up. You want to make a further comment? Go ahead. Yeah. I wanted to ask about cross sensory imagery. So, um, in two cases, well, synesthesia. So, how um, a person interprets color through hearing. And then um, also, I, I recall Dr. Sachs, Oliver Sachs, was doing some experiments where he connected some kind of sensors to a blind person's tongue. And he was able to um, bypass the traditional visual route and uh, produce imagery in that patient's brain through the uh, uh, taste bud receptors. Well, I can give you uh, uh, what comes. I really don't know much about the, the, the sort of synergy phenomena that you mentioned, but I, of course, I, I read about them and that sort of thing. Well, I, when a certain color, for example, uh, comes into someone's mind when you say the number eight and a different color when you say the number nine. But one very simple example of scenery you may have experienced. And if you take something like a pole and hold it in your hand and you tap on the sidewalk or the ground when you walk along, after a while, your feelings will sort of be not just that you're holding a pole and the pole is going up and down, but you start getting the sensation of actually touching and feeling the ground itself. And I wonder if some of the synergy might be something like that. In the brain itself, there are what some have called gnostic units. And when you talk about those cylinders and clusters of cells, uh, there is a view that the brain is organized into clusters of cells and those cells become conditioned to respond to certain 
sensory inputs or memories or emotions. It, it wouldn't be surprising if cells in the occipital lobe uh, trained or expected to process visual information may in fact through neuroplasticity become receptive to auditory or to even taste information. So the brain has enough flexibility in it that those units which may be dedicated to vision could in fact become adaptable to auditory phenomena. That, that's, not, that's not beyond reason when you talk about neoplasticity. As it relates to memory, uh, I'll add a point here. My, my master's thesis was about the biochemistry of memory in, in order to, to demonstrate or determine whether or not memory was in fact biochemical in nature. And when I hear you speak, Tommy, of translating a biochemical event into elec an electromagnetic event, it's conceivable that the, the movement of these polyproteins from one animal to another in an attempt to demonstrate memory transfer of a biochemical nature, that they, when that biochemistry got into the other animal, that it wasn't the biochemistry per se, but it was the electromagnetic phenomenon that resulted in the transfer. I'm not done yet, just yet, because I something has happened in the last year that I'm in, astounded with, and that is the capability of the of the body body stem cells to know when they are in, are in an environment to express the need for skin, uh, the need for heart muscle, that, that stem cell has registered in it the capability to detect when it is needed. It's conceivable when, when that biochemical polyprotein came into an environment that electromagnetically was a match or whatever, that it began to have impact on that, which resulted in a behavioral change. It's, it's a wild explanation, but I've lived for 60 years now wondering how the hell did that, uh, did that phenomenon happen? And what, you, what you've talked about today may in fact be simply another sensory input of a biochemical nature into the brain. Just as a COVID vaccine arriving in the brain may have behavioral ramifications. Um, I just wanna say, um, I did read that book. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. It brings me back to a lot of optical physics. Uh, there's a couple of things in there that uh, were quite interesting. Um, I gathered that physically we can define and understand everything up to the part that how does the mind interpret what we really see. And uh, Ray Kurzweil wrote a book, uh, The Singularity is Near, I think it was, several years ago. And he described how hearing and sight work. And he came almost to the same conclusion. The book goes up to the part that you wish there was one more chapter. It doesn't tell you the butler did it. So um, there's still an awful lot of work to be done in that area. Um, the um, With the eye itself, if we look at a picture, just looking at the wall, for example, we're always looking at a particular point. And the light coming back focused on the fovea in the back part of the eye, where the, uh, there's about 200,000 uh, cone cells per square millimeter back there for the fine definition. And as you get out on the retina, it's less defined. And the cells in the retina are like neurons, essentially. So there's a lot of interpretation there. I'm just wondering whether there's any pre-processing, so to speak, from the actual eye itself to the brain. Just the same as people talk about the brain in your heart, where there is a cluster of neurons in the top part of the heart that manage a lot of the functions of the heart and the communication between that and other parts of the body. Are there any any um, sensory pre-processing places that help us cope with or help us understand what we're seeing here? I well, well, yeah. uh, you may recall a diagram when I talked about uh, blur in the eye and how lateral inhibition, that's all happening in the eye. Uh, but you have only something like a half a millimeter of thickness of, of, of nerve cells to do that stuff. Also, besides uh, doing the processing for uh, reducing blur by lateral inhibition, you got, half, you got a substantial part of the processing to break up the inputs from three different types of uh, photoreceptor cells, breaking it up into six different types of neurons that are conducting information about red and not green, green and not red, blue and not yellow, yellow and not blue, 
black and not white, or white and not black. All that's happening in that half a millimeter of uh, in the back of your eye. A great deal of processing and more stuff. It's not clear to some, well, to some extent, there may be some type of feedback coming up the optic nerve as well. And to what extent might that play a role in changing our sensitivity to different levels of light, or perhaps even uh, changing the level of attention? That's well, even, even the sensitivity to red or green or blue uh, may be quite different in people. And we, you know, color blindness, all sorts of things like that, and how we can cope with that type of thing. Well, that, that, that sensitivity may be a byproduct of experience, or it could be a f physiological, or it could be even DNA based on. Uh, yeah. yeah. So p parsing them out is always a research challenge. Yeah. I did see a note, by the way, Tom, uh, as we get ready to wrap up, uh, some, someone noted that a recent study out of Yale claims that dinosaurs were warm blooded. Now, I cite that because it's just a one recent one piece of research and one piece of research doesn't make a hypothesis or a theory. But sometimes you have long standing assumptions that get challenged by one piece of research. Uh, other times you begin to realize that that piece of research was flawed. So my caution is for anybody. Uh, research alone is a long-standing process requiring a, a, a lot of in, independent views and uh, you know built on the giant on the shoulders of giants so one study doesn't make a fact anyway Tom your stuff has been phenomenal uh, I'm the, delighted to meet some old friends today and some of your old friends that have been with us uh, it's a fascinating topic uh, I'm at a, at a wrap-up point uh, uh, for recording Claire but I, I ask everybody to hold on for just a minute. I want to talk about where, where we're going next. Um, we've got one more webinar left in the season, which will be on uh, June 15th. The topic will be uh, on free expression, which is clearly in the news and quite relevant, whether you're talking politically or we're talking about what's going on in our schools or, or happening in gay councils. Um, free expression is not alive and well. Uh, and a fellow named Mark Milkey has been invited. He's the new CEO of the newly found uh, Aristotle Institute on Public Policy out of Calgary. Uh, he's got a lot to say. Uh, he's, well, let me say opinionated, uh, well-informed. I think you'll enjoy that as a wrap-up session. And we'll talk in that uh, webinar also about where we're going next fall. So um, as many friends are with me today, I say thank you to my friends. Thank you to newcomers. Catherine, we hope to see you again. Uh, Tommy, thank you so very much for what was a bit hectic uh, with our emails back and forth all week in shaping this, but uh, uh, you've, lift, you've lived up and exceeded my expectations. And, and I think on behalf of all of us, I wanna say thank you. <laughs>